Friends, the gospel lesson comes from the sixth chapter of John's gospel. And this morning I'm going to be reading from the message, the translation done by Eugene Peterson. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. The person who aligns with me hungers no more and thirsts no more, ever. I have told you this explicitly because even though you have seen me in action, you don't really believe me. Every person the Father gives me eventually comes running to me. And once that person is with me, I hold on and don't let go. I came down from heaven not to follow my own whim, but to accomplish the will of the one who sent me. This, in a nutshell, is that will, that everything handed over to me by the Father be completed, not a single detail missed, and at the wrap-up of time, I have everything and everyone put together, upright and whole. This is what my Father wants, that anyone who sees the Son and trust who he is and what he does, and then aligns with him, will enter real life, eternal life. My part is to put them on their feet, alive and whole, at the completion of time. At this, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven, the Jews started arguing over him. Isn't this the son of Joseph? Don't we know his father? Don't we know his mother? How can he now say, I came out of heaven, and expect anyone to believe him? Jesus said, don't bicker among yourselves over me. You're not in charge here. The Father who sent me is in charge. He draws people to me. That's the only way you'll ever come. Only then do I do my work, putting people together, setting them on their feet, ready for the end. This is what the prophets meant when they wrote, and then they will all be personally taught by God. Anyone who has spent time at all listening to the Father, really listening, and therefore learning, comes to me to be taught personally, to see with his own eyes, hear it with his own ears from me, since I have it firsthand from the Father. No one has seen the Father, except the one who has his being alongside the Father. And you can see me. I'm telling you the most solemn and sober truth now. Whoever believes in me has real life, eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the desert and died. But now, here is bread that truly comes down out of heaven. Anyone eating this bread will not die, ever. I am the bread, living bread, who came out of heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live, and forever. The bread that I present to the world so that it can eat and live is myself, this flesh and blood self. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. This week, when I learned that Helen's dad had had a brain hemorrhage and catastrophic stroke, I texted Dan to say that if he and Helen needed to be away this weekend, I was going to be here and would be available to preach. I know that there are lots of fine preachers in this congregation. Those of you who've been here this summer have heard lots of them. But a lot of people in this presbytery know that too, and so preachers here get invitations to preach in other places, and I didn't know who besides me would be here. I'm grateful to Walt that he is and, and agreed to be liturgist. What I did know was that if Jim Montgomery died, the last thing Dan and Helen needed to be doing was worrying about us this morning. They needed to be free to celebrate Jim's life with family and to lay him to rest. Dan texted me back to let me know that Jim had died, that his funeral would be Saturday, and Dan thought it would be a great idea if I would preach. That was Wednesday night. And Dan also let me know that it would be great to have the information that I wanted for the bulletin Thursday morning. So, so I went to 
the the church calendar for the year and looked up the texts for this morning and knew that even though I have a deep barrel of sermons, I could do no better than to preach you the lectionary texts. Both of the texts, both of these are texts that people have asked me to read at funerals. They're words of comfort and assurance for all kinds of difficult times, including and maybe especially times of grief and loss. In this passage from John that I just read, Jesus offers words of comfort, words of hope and life. Just before this text, Jesus has fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. And then Jesus and the disciples cross the Sea of Galilee, hoping for some time alone. But the people who've been fed the day before figure out, oh, he's on the other side of the sea, and they go around after him. They want more. Jesus tells them not to seek bread, which only lasts for a day, like the manna God gave their ancestors in the wilderness, but rather bread from heaven that lasts forever. They ask for this living bread, and Jesus begins to talk about himself as the bread which gives life, the bread that, if they trust him, will offer life now and always. This text is so familiar that I chose to read it in a translation we don't usually read. I really like Eugene Peterson's translation, The Message, and I think this text captures well what Jesus is talking about, especially when he uses the word trust. Jesus is not talking about intellectual assent, which is what we usually mean when we say believe. He's talking about trusting him, siding with him, aligning with him, responding to God's call and coming to him. The psalmist is talking about the same kind of thing in a different time and in different words. With the Lord there is unfailing love and redemption. God is our true hope, now and always. And it is God who takes the initiative. The psalmist waits like a guard on a watchtower looking for the dawn. Dawn comes in its own time and God comes in God's own time. Until God acts, we wait, ready to respond, even though sometimes the waiting and hoping can seem a lot longer than we want it to be. Andrew Pryor, A pastor in Adelaide, Australia, writes about his struggle when the time came to put his mother into a care facility and close up the family home. Describing the experience, he says he was undone. From pastoral experience, he knew that he and his family had achieved a rare harmony in the way they had supported and helped his mother make the transition in the way they had sorted through the things in their family home which would be sold and decided what to keep and what to give away and how to divide and all of the rest. They'd done well. He knew that they would see this transition through, but he was undone. For him in that moment, the arbitrary indignity of old age and dying seemed to write off the mysticism of the sixth chapter of John. But then he says, did it really? When age and grief strip us of our dignity and our hard-won humanity so that we don't know whether we're coming or going, so that we don't even know who we are, and the ravages of age are only one form of this agony, what remains? Pryor says, if our answer is God remains, then our God is too small too tame, and too much of our own imagining, we are not yet undone. To be undone is to lose our fragile connections to God. It's to have our theological pretensions crumble. A friend of mine said to me when I called him after the death of his son in a motorcycle accident on his motorcycle, I am grateful for your call. I am grateful for your prayers. I'm getting by just now. On the faith of my friends, I can have no faith of my own. In difficult times, 
whether it's that deep in agony or not so deep in agony, in difficult times when things seem to fall apart, the community we are with each other is so vital for the life of our friends. It's just as vital for the life of our world all the time. This text in John's Gospel has been used in the church through the centuries to draw a dividing line between the insiders and the outsiders, between those who believe and those who don't. The hungry come to Jesus wanting more bread for themselves, and Jesus upends their expectations. Salvation, enlightenment, eternal life, wisdom are not the product of human work or human asking as daily bread can be. Bread for your belly requires the sweat of your brow or the kindness of strangers. Yet, provided in the manna of the wilderness and now fully revealed in Jesus, the bread of life is offered to all who are hungry, hungry enough to trust that five barley loaves and two fish can feed a multitude. The disciples passing out the loaves on the hillside are not like the soup Nazi in the old Seinfeld show. Soup for you, soup for you, no soup for you. No, all who showed up and sat down were fed and there were leftovers, 12 baskets of them. This bread is Jesus and is offered for the life of the whole world. All those whom God draws to Jesus belong to him. There's nothing to achieve or do, which means we don't get to decide and designate who gets some and who doesn't. We're not the baker or the distributor. We're just another hungry pilgrim on the hillside or in the wilderness. The late D.T. Niles, a pastor in what is now Ceylon and in his lifetime was Sri Lanka, and the former head of the World Council of Churches wrote about evangelism that it is one beggar telling another beggar where to get food. The Christian does not offer out of his bounty, Dr. Niles said. He has no bounty. He is simply guest at his master's table, and as evangelist, he calls others too. The evangelistic relationship is to be alongside of, not over against. The Christian stands alongside the non-Christian and points to the gospel, the holy action of God. It's not his knowledge of God that he shares, it is to God himself that he points. The Christian gospel is the word become flesh. I think about Dr. Niles' description of evangelism every time I roll down my car window and hand off a bag to somebody begging on a street corner. The bag I share has been prepared for me to share by our children and youth. I did nothing except pick it up. Oh, sometimes if I have them to spare, I'll add some soap or toothpaste and a toothbrush, maybe another protein bar. But mostly, I give what I get. Food and water and information about about where to get more help. The young people who prepare these bags are my heroes. They make it possible for me to easily do what I am too lazy to think to do on my own. Not often, but but sometimes, the person I hand a bag to will say something. Maybe he or she will say, oh, this is exactly what I needed. Or maybe, what a great idea. Where did you get it? And once, when I got off of I-4 at Lee Road, there was a man standing there giving out American flags. I think it was shortly before the 4th of July. And so he gave me a flag and I gave him a bag and we talked about um, the kids here and our church and what we do. We talked so long that the guy behind me blew his horn, which was the first time I noticed that the light had changed. It's just my hunch, but it is my hunch, that the folks who get the bags don't get to have a lot of conversation with people who see them as people. 
But I know that I am literally one beggar who always asks for more than one bag, telling another beggar where to find food and life beyond the street corner. I hand him a bag that has both food and information about more help in it. Whether it's sharing food with neighbors on the street corner or being there when those we love go through difficult times, we are called, all of us, to share the bread of life, the one who is the life of the world, the word become flesh. Thanks be to God, who calls us into life together, now and always. Amen.